to a man, they all say, when you walk in there, if you want this, you better let them know, like, mm -hmm. you can't leave without this or they're going to go another direction. So I completely understood why the Mets did what they did. I drove to that interview going, man, if I get this, I don't, I don't even know if my wife will come with me. So it's like I didn't have all my ducks in a row going through these processes. <laughs> hey, everybody, and welcome to episode number 179 of the Chris Rose Rotation, a production of John Boy Media. And I, I, I could barely sleep last night. I was so excited to talk to my good friend. He, of course, will be leading Team USA into battle in the next few weeks in the World Baseball Classic. The one and only Mark DeRosa, who... I'm, you're not wearing your Dallas Cowboys gear today after the Eagles lost Super Bowl 57? <laughs> no, we got a lot to work on. Listen, I'm ride or die. You know this. I'm ride or die with Dak Prescott. I have to be. Walter Payton man of the year. Like, I can't Good. not love him. So it's like I want to believe he can get me to the promised land, but he's got to show me still. You know what's amazing? So they, you know, they introduce all the Hall of Famers at the Super Bowl during a break. And they also introduced the Walter Payton Man of the Year winner. And because that crowd was so heavy Philly, he got booed after being the recipient of the Walter Payton Man of the Year. It was so on brand for Philly fan. Rosie, the whole time since I've been named manager of Team USA, I know how big a fan of Philly that Mike Trout is. So, like, there's been a lot of back and forth here. I like He knew we wouldn't get out of San Francisco, and I kind of, you know... I figured they were the favorites to get to the Super Bowl. I left them alone after this one ended, but there was a lot of trash talk back and forth. So when you see him for the first day of Team USA camp, you better give him some shit. I'm, I, you know, I want the best version of Mike, and if I'm going to upset him by <laughs> talking about the Philadelphia Eagles, then I'm not going to go there. I just, you know, I mean, when his coach is crying national anthem, he's doing all the – you don't play, <laughs> by the way, Nick. So we're coming to get him next year. <laughs> so wait a second. Are you saying that you're not going to be crying during the, uh, during the star spangled banner of game one no. against great Britain? No, no. no I'm thinking tears? about some people and why I'm there and why I'm out on that line. I always do, but I will not be bringing that attention to myself. No. Okay. We got a lot of ground to cover here. I'm so no. excited about this. Let's start with this though. Are you, are there nights where you wake up in the middle of the night and you're creating lineups and you're like, holy shit, I cannot wait for this. Yeah. I, I think it's a little bit more of, I'm not going to say, holy shit, I can't wait yet because I'm trying to dot every I and cross every T I'm, I, I'm trying to ask way too many opinions is what I've realized during Ooh. this process, but I want everyone to feel good about it. Rosie, that's just who I am. Like, I want to know where Mookie Betts feels comfortable hitting in the lineup. I want to know what Trey Turner's about. I Half my life, since I've been named a manager, half the time has been spent on the phone. I want to pick the brains of all the managers. You know, talk to Dave Roberts. What makes Trey Turner tick? What makes Mookie Betts tick? What, what? How do I handle Clayton? Then you flip to the pitching coach side of it. How do you want me handling these guys? I will not jeopardize any of these guys potentially getting hurt to try and win this thing. So I am well aware of trying to return these guys healthy to the parent club. But when the doors do shut, I, I the message will be loud and clear to that we are here to win this thing. Have you thought about that first speech? I have. I've gone a million different ways with it. I don't want to get too wordy with it. I want to be short and to the point. But it will be directed towards trying to get their chairs to face the middle of the clubhouse instead of being on an island by themselves. Because I, I, I think the biggest thing I took away from 2009 when I got a chance to do it, and I don't think we knew necessarily what we were getting into. I don't think guys prepared back then the way these guys are preparing now for this thing. But I just remember Dustin Pedroia coming in and kind of treating it like we had all been his teammates before. He came in hot. He was ragging guys. He was after Jeter. Like he was, and, and it was a quick, like, boom. All right. If that's, everybody's got like kind of thick skin, we can kind of be self-deprecating. This is going to be awesome. And that's exactly what it is. So that's my expectations. And I don't think that's going to be hard to do with, 
with the conversations I've had with a lot of these guys. These guys are killers, man. I, you know, you, you, you watch them at night, Rosie, but you get to meet them a little bit more often than I do. And just being in their presence and talking to them on the phone, it's like I'm falling in love with, with them even more. I'm not asking you to pick your favorite kid in the class, but who did yeah. you pick up the phone with that, that you didn't really know? And you were like, you hung it up and you were like, oh, oh, that's Aronado. impressive. Arenado's been that guy for me. He he's old school. And I hate that moniker because I, you know, I like to dabble in both. But this guy is like, he could have played any generation and, and kind of ran a clubhouse with the way he carries himself. He is passionate about the game. I mean, to the nth degree. He was calling me from jump, like, who's pitching for us? Like, if I'm gonna do this, I want it. I'm all in like I, we're going after this. So and that's been the message from a lot of the guys. I mean, Trout wouldn't be doing this. Anything but winning this thing's a failure in a lot of these guys eyes. So I love that fact. Once the door closes and we get these 30 guys behind closed doors and we can meet with them and like really start to bring them together and try and build some type of three week chemistry. I'm, I, I cannot wait to just deploy this lineup on the world well that's what trout said he's like yeah. i'm here to win it's that simple i'm not doing this for any other reason and i believe him the guy's played in three fucking playoff games in his life this is a big deal to him how much pressure are you feeling you know i'm not feeling a ton of pressure my pressure is to do right by the guys and do right by the teams that's it honestly i want to make sure everybody feels good about listen i get it I got it from a position player standpoint. This is a no brainer to be involved in this. No brainer. Playoff atmosphere ABs in March. You go back to spring training with about 10 days to go. You are ready to roll. There's not a guy who's going to step on the mound opening day that is going to blow a fastball by you. You are locked. So I get all that. From a pitching standpoint, I can understand the trepidation for a lot of organizations to want to give their big dogs you know, a chance at this thing because it, it would impact their season. I'm, I'm, I am completely like aware of that, but on the flip side, if we're going to grow this game, this thing is a great event. And if it's going to run during this time and it's not going to be looked to be moved to a different time or try something different, then I do think some organizations have to get on board a little bit more with, uh, being excited about their players participating in this. You don't have to give me a name, but was there a team that you talked to where you were like, man, they, they, they have to loosen a little bit. There's a couple of them, Rosie. There's a couple of them. And, and I get it. And, and, and you could probably figure who they are. I mean, these are teams that are got a chance to win world series and have world series aspirations on the flip side. There's other organizations in the same boat as them that were, just in love with the idea of their guys coming and participating. This is a once in a in, in a in a career opportunity. I mean, I, I walked away in 09. I was so happy I got picked, but I walked away from it and went back to to spring training with uh in surprise with Cleveland and was was like that was the best experience I've ever. I mean, I got a chance to be in a BP group for three weeks with Jeter and David Wright and Pedroia and Jimmy Rollins and just to pick their brains and, and and to kind of rub shoulders and be like, oh, okay, like maybe I am pretty decent at this game. And it gives you just this vote of confidence when you leave that like, hey, maybe I am one of the better players. I can't wait to hear. I, I almost want to talk to you once you're done just to see what the experience was like with these guys and who you yeah. walk away saying way better than I ever thought. Because some funny. of these guys, particularly the pitchers, are names on a piece of paper a little bit. It's funny you say that because I remember in 09 when we left and I talked to, to Brian McCann that day and we were saying like, man, I didn't realize Ryan Braun was that. I didn't realize Jimmy Rollins. I knew they were good, but like Jimmy Rollins could do everything. And in a three week window, he was like him and Jeter were going back and forth. And for that three week window, I was like, man, there's not an aspect of the game that Jimmy Rollins can't dominate. Like he hits for power, hits for average runs, plays D. 
he's a hell of a lot better than I thought he was. So yeah, there, I think there is a lot of that, just a respect factor there for a lot of these guys. I love it that Paul Goldschmidt is back because I remember it. Listen, the reason I have this hat, I went to the final out here at Dodger stadium in 2017. And a big piece of that was Eric Hosmer. Yeah. Goldschmidt could not get on the field, could not get on the field. And you were like, man, what a crappy time for him. He should be back in Diamondbacks camp. To, and instead, I heard he was one of the first guys who was like, yeah, I'm in. Of course. Yeah, yeah. It, it's funny. My my first call when I got named the manager was to Jim Leland. And I sat on the phone with him for about an hour, hour and a half, just kind of picking his brain. And he said, listen, you have, you have two jobs. You have – to bring them together as a team as quick as possible and to return them to their parent club healthy. He goes, now someone's going to tweak something. You're going to feel terrible about it, but it, it just, it is what it is. But then kind of leading into the Goldschmidt, he was just saying, who will play? You give the guys there at bats. And then when you get to Miami and you got a chance to win this thing, you know how spring training is. You either hit a dollar 10 or five ten. There's not the guy who usually hits 280 in spring training. You either stink or you can't get out. And you're like, man, I'm wasting all these hits in spring training. So that's what I've told the guys. I've tried to be transparent and honest in my conversations with them, Rosie, and kind of told them that, listen, hot hand's going to play once we get into these elimination games. And that's what happened to Goldie. Like, Haas got hot at the right time. I would assume, I would assume Goldie will be fine. Okay, you have the balls to tell Mookie Betts, hey, man, why don't well, you watch a, from here? Well, there's a few that may be going to get a little bit more carp. I mean, Mike Trout's going to play. <laughs> <laughs> He's two for 20, and Cedric Mullins is 12 for 20. I, I'll move Cedric to a corner. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Dude, it's a hell of a staff you put together here, too. Does Griffey have any eligibility or is he done? <laughs> it's funny. I've been picking his brain on where to hit guys in the lineup because the game's changed a little bit, right? Mike, Mike Trout is like, in our minds, was would always hit third. But in today's game for right. the last, you know, five, six years, these the, the maulers have been hitting second. So I kind of just pick his brain. But it has been... this The staff has been amazing. It's been one of those situations where it's like, you come in excited to be a part of it and now it's gotten into like where that's worn off and it's like the grind of of wanting to do this right so like i spend every day talking with multiple coaches on the staff i mean andy pettit and me are going to be best buddies after this he has been phenomenal as a pitching coach dave Rigetti has been i i mean mm. fortunate to win a world series with him so I sat there in 2010 and watched him and Boach just pick that bullpen apart and get us to a World Series. Uh, Jerry Manuel has been great, not going to let me fall on my face. That's all I tell him. Mm -hmm. You've won over 700 games, man. If you see I'm about to you know, fall on my face, I need you to jump in. And then I brought some of my boys with me. I got Michael. Sure as hell did. Is this, you're not going to have time to golf, brother. You keep McCann. <laughs> And that back sweat that he's got, you tell him to start working. Let him do his cardio during the day and sit his ass on the bench next to you as the number two bench coach and take care of you. you he can bring you the beer. We're going to go out a couple days early to get it out of our system. But Brian McCann has been my ride or die for, you know, 20 years now. So he's coming with me. And uh, and Michael Young's going to come with me, too, and help Griffey out. So I needed two guys that would take a bullet for me. I didn't get to necessarily pick the staff, and these guys have been awesome. But when, when I turned to Tony Regans after he after he named me the manager, I said, you know, I got to know there's a couple guys who would be willing to die for me in the dugout. So that he was cool with that. Okay. This is a sprint. It is not a 162-game schedule. You are not flying from Kansas City to Minnesota to Seattle over an 11-day span and going to be away from your family. But is this a personal litmus test for you to see whether or not you really want to do this? I don't I, I hate to say I don't know, but I thought this was the perfect opportunity. For me personally, where I am at this stage in my life, I have two. two uh, Rosie, I don't want to get like 
sentimental or cheesy, but my father was always there. And what I mean by that is every game I ever played up into pro ball, he was there. My mom and dad were present in my life. And I always felt like my, my son's 13 right now. He's in the midst of like travel ball and like really coming into his own. My daughter's a freshman at Auburn. It's two hours away. She comes home all the time. So like with my job and what I'm doing, I am afforded the opportunity to like be a significant part of their life on a daily basis. And I just know me like like I think back to my playing days. And like my son was an infant at the end. I don't even remember those years. Like not to be like so honest, but it was like blink of an eye. He's five and I'm retired. But that that one through four window, I was concerned with trying to get hits on a nightly basis. So that, that was it takes you away from it. So when I go, if I go, I want to know like I am. 100% all in. I felt like this was an opportunity for like you said a sprint with the greatest players in the world to kind of to kind of, you know, see what it's like, get in there, but like I'm not I I also don't feel like I'm doing this for me. I I feel like I, I've always just loved the players and loved their stories and want to yeah. give them the best chance to be have an experience. I want to create that was my message to Paul Seiler. When the head of USA, I say, I want to create an experience for these guys. Like I want to bring in some special guest speakers. I want, I want, I want them to leave these three weeks going. That was the best three weeks of my career. Who are you working on? We got some big names. I'm trying to pull off. We'll see. How big? I mean, the biggest. We'll see what I can Entertainers? do. Entertainers, you know, mem members of Dream, the, the Dream Team. I wanted some affiliation with the United States. You know. Well, wait, hold on, Leitner. I uh, you, uh, I would love Leitner in there, but like Magic, Barkley, like that type of. I've reached out to Jeter about him walking through. I've reached out to Pedro. He's big, big TV star now. Big TV no, star, I not thought, don't have I saw time. That. I saw that. But I want these guys to be around. Like I want, I want them at every time they turn their head to be like, whoa. Do you, well, do you do also do the military thing? Like, do you no. yeah, you're gonna bring it? I'm gonna bring it. I'm gonna bring it. That's why we're wearing it. At least for me. At least for me, that's why I stood on the line. I stood on the line for all the people that were fighting for our freedom and allowed me the opportunity to rest my head at night and get to play a kid's game for a living for a ton of money to entertain people. So, you know, my grandfather fought in the world war, war uh, world war. And, and my dad was in like, I, that's why I stand right. Nine 11 is another big factor. I grew up in the, in the shadows of the twin towers. When I walked out my front door, that's what I looked at. Right. New Jersey. Boom. And, and for those people to have to go through that, those are the reasons I stand. So I know that's not everyone's stance on it, but that's why I stand. And that's why, yeah, I want, I want them to realize there's a, that, that part of it, no doubt. Okay. I look forward to hearing who's going to be in there talking. Don't, don't bring Millar. His vocabulary is not expansive enough for these guys. He just wants to shag in the outfield. He said, <laughs> Please talk about blown out of hammy. Although he looks good, man. He's he looks good. I don't know how much you've seen him in person, you know, since he just does it out of his little Austin hotel room. I saw him two weeks ago, two, three weeks ago. John Lester had a retirement weekend down oh, in God. South, South Georgia. Yeah, it got after we got after it. It yeah. was good. A lot Everybody of people was... I haven't seen in a long time came in. So it was I I love that. Who had the most? fun that weekend out of the ball players was lackey there who had the most fun lackey was there lackey was tame actually lackey was tame. What? josh beck he was josh beckett always has fun yeah i does. thought it was i i had a great great chance to like catch up with brandon hyde was there i talked to him for the mm. first time i got to know him with he was with yeah, eric he, he's all they're awesome pedroia was there um uh, david ross was there 
there was a lot, lot of old Red Sox guys and old Cubby guys. I got a chance to talk to Schwarber, Daniel oh. Bullard, two guys that are on the roster. So I sat with them for a little bit. So it was a good, it was a good group. That's nice. Yeah. I do want to get back to the the managerial prospects for you very quickly. You did have interviews with teams, didn't you, a few years ago? Yeah. Well, I I always, you know, it's funny, like I always knew Jeffrey Loria because of the Ivy League thing. He always like kind of took a liking to me. He was a Columbia guy and and myself going to Penn. So every time I came down to, to play the Marlins as a young like utility guy, he always made it a point to come say hello. He was like, you know, I'm the Ivy League guy in the big leagues right now. And that, 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 that. So we actually kind of got built this friendship. So when that managerial job came open, this was like 15. I think yeah. the Mets, Mets were in the World Series that year. The 15? Yep. Mm-hmm. He called me. He goes, hey. And he was completely honest. He's like, hey, I'm probably going to give this job to Don Mattingly. Like is if, if he leaves the Dodgers at the time, I think there was something there. He's like, would you would you, would you want to go through the interview process? Kind of get a feel for how how you do it. So, I mean, to call that an interview, I don't know. I did. I went through the entire process, went to his office in New York, sat with him for hours, went to dinner, flew to Miami, met their met their people down there, went through the whole process. They end up going with Donnie, obviously. Um and then I interviewed for the Mets when they gave it to Mickey Calloway. Did you and want that, that job? And that was enough. That's that's the problem, Rosie. Like what I've realized, and Sandy Alderson said that to me. That was seventeen. I remember we landed for the World Series out in L.A. and Sandy Alderson called my phone at baggage claim, and he was like, "We're gonna we're gonna announce Mickey Calloway as the manager," and I was just like. I was like, Sandy, I just have to know, like, how? Like, how do you come to that decision? And he's like, at no point during the interview did you say, I'm dying to be the Mets manager. Like, truly, like, ready to do it. And it's funny because I think back to some of the conversations I've had with Booney and Cora and A.J. Hinch and some of the managers that I have built a relationship with and played against. To a man, they all say, when you walk in there, if you want this, you better let them know, like, Mm -hmm. you can't leave without this or they're going to go another direction. So I completely understood why the Mets did what they did. I drove to that interview going, man, if I get this, I don't don't even know if my wife will come with me. So it's like I didn't have all my ducks in a row going through these processes. (laughs) (laughs) Heidi will check in occasionally. How's it go? I haven't even noticed. What is your record? 42 games. And then when, so when I got called by Tony Regans to do this, I was like, this is a one month greatest players in the world chance to represent your country. Like chance for you to let these guys know like what it should look like, like create an atmosphere that they want to, they want to kill for you. So I got in that car service driving into the city completely different. Like this fit right into my schedule. So I, went, you cannot- I, went, I went in flying. I'm like, Tony, I want this. I'm your guy. And he bought now, it. Do you think you would have taken this job, though, if they said you have to use our bench coach, Robert Flores? <laughs> no, I would have walked. <laughs> That's it. He can't because he would have had his gamer decision. headset on the whole day. I would have walked if it. How about Millar? If I would have had that Millar as my bench coach, that would have been interesting. Yeah. No, it's it's. Still it's there's, well, go ahead. I was just going to say he still thinks there's four outs in inning instead of three, yeah. but don't worry, he'll figure that one out. Yeah. At some <laughs> point. Um. Mark, I I love what you say about wanting to see your son play. I get that more than anybody, right? I'm always first flight out. If I'm coming home, I'm last flight out so I can make every one of Brady's games that I can. Is there a part of you that says, I might be screwing myself on like an opportunity? Like by the time he's done, you're going to be in your early 50s. That's not old because I'm there right now. But maybe people aren't going to be as hot on Mark DeRosa five years from now. It's fair. It's fair. And I have thought that 
and uh, I just weigh the pros and cons of it. It's going, I hate to say this because, but it's the truth. And I, I only know one way to be true. The network pays me very handsomely to do what I do. Yeah. So I want someone to knock my freaking socks off to get me to not do this. I mean, I work six months out of the year. The minute the last out of the World Series is is made, I'm 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 home. I'm taking my kid to school. I'm playing golf with the buddy with my buddies. I'm living a normal life and and financially getting you getting, can do it. Getting paid on 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 a yep. significant level to a lot. What are these guys are making? So I don't want to give this up just to scratch an itch. I want somebody to force me to wake up every morning and not think of anything else. Well, listen, you know, I've always loved uh, MLB Central. I think you guys do an amazing job. It's not easy filling the time that you do every day with baseball, it's, and you do an exceptional job. Have you ever had somebody criticize you? One of your – a ball player come up and say, Dero, did you forget how fucking hard this thing is? Mm, not really. I think I'm very under yeah, you're player friendly. Yeah, man. I know how hard it is. I know how hard it was for me. Um, yeah, I do everything in my power not to not to go to negative town with anything that I see on a nightly basis, unless it's to do with, you know, ripping a GM for a trade he makes that I know is going to impact the clubhouse or a manager making you know, a, a silly move to go to a bullpen piece. Those are the things I I, I go after. Like we're de a perfect example. During this process, we have, I'm a big, like, you know me, I want the analytics. Like I am not mm -hmm. a guy who's like, no, no, no. Give me, give me the answers to the test and we'll weave it into, you know, what we think is, is real time and what these guys need. I don't think they need it all, but there is definitely some things that I want. So we hired the Dodgers analytics guy to help us throughout the course of this. His name is Pat O'Shea, and, and he has been phenomenal. But I find myself consistently going, Pat, how can I trust you when in the postseason, I watch you guys race to get into your bullpen? I mean, it's a sprint. <laughs> well, we got to get to Phil Bickford now. <laughs> Tommy Canley is pitching now. I'm like, I don't get it. So if that's kind of what you're going to come at me with, I'm going to fight hard back against you. But he has been. I love those conversations. You know how it was. I love going back in research at MLB Network and getting into yeah. it with those guys back there. They are passionate yeah. about what they do. So, by the way, what does he say? Did he give you an explanation as to why they're so amped up when it comes to that stuff? The numbers don't lie. But it's funny, like, so, for example, I've probably given you too much here, but I was like, hey, give me your, we're going to face a righty, so to speak, give me your perfect lineup based on the numbers. And he had Jeff McNeil leading off and Trey Turner towards the bottom of the order. And I said to him, you know, I disagree with that and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, well, this is just based on raw data versus a right-hander coming off last year. And I said, okay, but now you're Trey Turner. You just signed for $300 million with the Phillies. You're a guy. And you walk in that door, no offense to Jeff McNeil, but you see him leading off and you're batting eighth or ninth. You pissed off? He goes, yeah. I said, do you think you're getting the best version of Trey Turner tonight? He goes, probably not. I said, then why, why would you do that? So I think there you have to have the, that blend. Well, Basically, then how, do, but how do you handle this? Trey Turner's I, leading off. What are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, I can't wait till Great Britain's throwing their best right hander and I'm watching Turner's hit eighth. I'm gonna know who won that argument. He won't Not be. Happy. Not, happen. Not happening, Rosie. There's something to be said for the back of the baseball card and do it like, yeah. I think the biggest thing I'm dealing with right now is is, you know, why I ask him why did you lead off Mookie Betts? Like, 
to me, Trey screams lead off. Mookie screams second, Freddie. If you want to split it up, Trey, Freddie, Mookie. I said, but you consistently, every night I flipped it on, it was Mookie bets. And a lot of that deals with Mookie. Like that's his skill set. He'll come in and say, hey, you know, I want to be a leadoff guy. And da, 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 da. I think this year in my me talking to David Roberts a little bit, I, I would expect Mookie to hit a little bit lower in the order for the Dodgers. Yeah. So that's what I'm going to try and do for the WBC. So I'm kind of leaning Turner, Trout, Betts, Goldie right now. Dude, you're Good. playing fantasy baseball. It's the best joke. version the ever. The lineup is a joke. It's a joke. And and we sit on these Zoom calls, Chris, and we're trying to pick apart Mexico and Great Britain and pit, set the pitching up perfectly, analytically, and where these guys are at and what shapes and gets guys out. And, and I said, man, we are so focused on our pitching. I under, understand that. But, like, how is anybody going to get through our lineup? <laughs> might be able to throw a position player if you're up 10 in the ninth somebody's gonna gonna get you it's just the way it is it's too deep so good. Schorber and arenado and tucker and alonzo and real muto and it's just too much that's a damn good lineup i do want to talk a little bit about you and your playing career did when you eventually decided to go to penn were you thinking man it's been a great athletic run i'm gonna do both sports I'll quarterback the football team. I'll be the shortstop on the baseball team, but yeah. probably this is where it's going to end is the Ivy league. Yeah. I... No. no. Okay, I, good. I, That's I what I wanted to hear. I went there because I felt like I was a late bloomer and I was undersized. I was six one one seventy five graduating high school. Lacked mobility, but football, I felt like I could flat play. Like I, I did, I had scholarships to some pretty good colleges to go as, as strictly a football player. And that's what I was leaning towards doing. And my, my, my dad was big on baseball. He was like, man, I, I see something special in you. I don't think, you know, where are you going at, at six, one, one seventy five, you don't run real well. Like where are you going? You're not Joe Montana, Mark. I hate to break it to you. <laughs> But I think you should keep playing baseball. So if that means, you know, we got to pay for your education, I'm willing to do that. So it was, it was that's how the pen kind of came into fold. It was kind of like, okay, where can I, if this doesn't work out, have the best education possible? Because I, Rosie, you know this, I was completely overmatched in the classroom at Penn. You weren't overmatched. Don't say Over that. Overmatched. I used to sit in class and I'd be like, that was their football field for a lot of for a lot of these kids. They were like, this, this was competition. Now I'm sitting here going, wow, all right. Like I'm on a whole nother level of education. <laughs> I, just gotta, the- I just gotta stay eligible. That was my goal. Well- you what what you uh you grew you graduated from Wharton, didn't you? I had two two seven, but I but I, I you know I manipulated it. I was able to drop classes and add classes and do some things to to make what, it. What was the hardest class you took? Econ econ two. That's the scary thing at Penn is when when you see the professor stand up there for the first day of class. When he writes his name and you look at your textbook, he's the author. So it's like <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole nother level of smart. So I, I, I that was the biggest thing for me. My dad's like, there's no you wouldn't have got into this school regularly. So let's go. And if it doesn't work out. And I, I was talking about this yesterday. Like I went in football through and through like. I wanted to to lead the football team to the Ivy title for, you know, all my time there and blah, blah, blah. And then I got invited to Cape Cod in 95 after, after the baseball season. And I was going to back up Troy Gloss and John McDonald. That was the left side. Johnny of, Mac. Johnny Mac. That was the left side of the Bourne Braves in 1995. And I was the, you know, utility guy. And Troy was so damn good that he left for team USA. And so I got to 
I got to play and I made the all-star team and played really well. And there was a lot of big names there. And so when I left, it kind of flipped my whole thoughts. Like that was like, man, if that's the best college players in the world that I've read about the Cal state Fullerton's and LSU's and all the, I'm like, I could play there. Uh, so I like it flipped. I'm like, I'm going to get drafted now. Like that's, I guess that's what's going to happen. So then, you know, football kind of got put on the back burner and I focused on trying to do the baseball thing. I did. I just want everybody to know though, somebody was undefeated here, freshman year quarterback in the team. Hey, football was my jam, man. I, it really was. I, I, uh, I think I, you know, made my living in baseball, but I think football is the ultimate sport. I always thought it was the ultimate sport. That's blood, sweat, and tears with your boys. Like I lived with seven football players in college. I still talk to them to this day. We do fantasy football together. We go to Vegas together. Like those are my guys. Not so bad. It's, it's hey, different... who, who else was at that Cape Cod league that you said that was there were some oh real my. studs? Who was on Eric? Do you remember Eric Milton? He threw the no hitter for the. Twins. Yeah, of course they do. The lefty for the Orioles and the Twins. Who's on my God? The All Star game was like Johnny Mac and uh, Marco Scudero and Scudero. Who else was up there? Kotze and I'd have to I, I'd have to look through look through it, but yeah, yeah. it was almost like the coming out party to play up there. Good. Hey. um, do you remember the day you got called up to the show? Yeah. 1998. I think I have, I have some relics of that back here. Yeah, I remember I got called up. I was in double A uh, with Greenville, Greenville Braves. And my manager, Randy Ingle, said that I was going up. And at the time, I thought I was going to triple A. And he said, no, you're going to big leagues, man. They, 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 I was like, what? Okay. <laughs> So I called my dad and I was like, Hey, guess what? I woke him up and he's like, how'd you play? And I was like, I don't even remember. I was like, I'm going to the big leagues tonight. And he goes, you're not ready. <laughs> <laughs> I go, I, know. I go, I know I'm not ready, but I'm going. So yeah. So I got, I got called up. It was Sunday night baseball at Turner field Maddox against Randy Johnson when he was with Houston and Bobby looked down at me, I think it was like the fifth or sixth inning. He's like, Hey, you're going to pinch hit for, for doggy. So I didn't even have time to process it. I just grabbed a helmet and a bat and I went up and hit. And when I looked up, I was like, Holy shit. It's Randy John. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, like, I think, yeah. Shit. But he's is a seventh day. He was the perfect guy to face. Hey, I thought I was. On. I thought I was. Oh, I did. And now he blows my doors off. <laughs> now he goes slider. <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> he fouled off slider. Right. I'm going to strike out. And as I'm running to first base. Right here, look how crouched, terrible. How are you supposed to hit like that? So I run to first base, and I'm like, oh, my God, Jeff Bagwell. <laughs> that was what I was thinking. <laughs> it's like, that's Jeff Bagwell. <laughs> it, took, Dude, but it took me a minute. You had a, you had a freaking locker room full of Cooperstown bound guys, though. That was I mean, the it toughest locker room to walk into, Rosie. It was. I always say that spring training, your first big league camp, when you walked into Disney, it was like Hall of Fame row, right when you walked in. Maddox, Glavin, Smoltz, Andrew, Chipper, whoever the big dog was, whether it was Galarraga, Sheffield, I mean, Javi, Vinny, we had a, we had, there were monsters in that clubhouse for a while. But I, I, I loved every second of it because the expectation on a nightly basis was we're going to win. And that's not the case in every place. Did they give it to you? Did they give it to you as a kid? Like guys ripped you hard. I did everything. I did everything. Sang on the bus. 
And the Braves, it's different because they don't bring up young guys. It's like one a year. Yeah. You're a rookie for like three years there. So <laughs> I carried beers. I sang on the bus. I, I had to clear customs in the stupidest outfits known to man to get to Montreal. Uh, I I had to – BJ Surhoff used to make me go down and get his bag and then bring it to his room and then unpack it into the dressers. Like, Yeah. That is so good. But he's still right, I want to hit you with a what's that? But he still texts me to this day, BJ. All time. What is what what does it say? I'm in Hawaii. Come on, pack my bag. <laughs> no, he'll be like, hey, watching the show, you're doing a good job, or give me a nugget. There's a lot of lot of former players that will text me throughout the course of the show. All right. I got a couple quick hitters and I'll let you get back to uh fielding calls from Andy Pettit and Ken Griffey Jr. Yeah. Uh first time you laced it up with pool holes. What was yeah. your reaction? Best hitter I've ever been in a, in a clubhouse with. That's what I thought. i never seen a guy get four at bat tonight and hit three balls on the absolute button for a full year. I always go back to this story. I'll say it real quick. We were in Cincinnati. I had just gotten traded over 2009. Bases loaded. David Stormy Weathers on the mound, and Tony LaRusso calls down and says, Get Ryan Franklin going. That was our closer. We we're down by three runs. He knew that Pools was about to hit a granny, and we we're going to have to bring in our. <laughs> and and? He, he did. Facade, bang. We win by one. Closer comes in, game over. I remember being in the line going, Oh my God, he's like the greatest hitter I've ever seen in my life. Mm. that's incredible by the way yeah. that was the first time i met you was that summer remember in cleveland yes you were yeah yeah you were with cleveland for the half year and i met you i was like it's great to have you here man i'm really really happy that you're here and then fucking you got ditched we, been, we sucked the first been better. <sighs> but when you rough. think back like we just didn't have the horses on the mound we had cliff no. and pavano was like Hit or miss, and then it was like a bunch of lefty journeymen. Yeah, Sowers and Dave, uh, David, Jeremy was. Sowers. You hear that? And uh, oh god, I can't even remember their names anymore. No. All right, we're moving on. One game to win. Which starting pitcher that you played with are you going with, and why? <sighs> Oh, my God. I did not expect that to come at me. We've got Brave staff. I mean, we've we got Giants Kevin, staff. We've got Giants. we got Strasburg at the height of his food chain there. Cubs, no. Cleveland, Cliff Lee. That's, good, that's a good question. I know. Let's go. Lincecum. Maddox. You know, you know, you know, when when Timmy's right, I would think he would be the most unhittable. I'd want to close the game with Smoltz. So I'd want to like save him. The easy answer is Greg Maddox, but it's like that's the easy answer. I'm gonna say the freak. When the freak took the mound in San Francisco to electric feel. Come out song. That place lit up. I'm going to say the freak. I That's a good one. I like that. Speaking of that place, was Brian Wilson more skit than the real thing? Brian Wilson, what, we hung out probably every night on the road throughout the course of that 2010 season. Um, one of the better, deeper individuals I had ever played with. A lot more skit than who he is as a man. He gets it. I always dug him. He was on the Rose rotation. I loved oh, I about him. Like... You know what I loved about him, Rosie? He respected the game. And what I mean by that, like, he wasn't too proud to say, well, I could just throw it past anyone. If you go back and watch him, he was strategic in how he pitched to guys. Like, 
If the best player on their team was coming up, there's a little cutter off the plate. You can walk to first. I'll punch the next guy out. Like he never allowed his ego to get in the way of getting outs. And I always respected that about him. Last thing. Uh, you've had hundreds of teammates. The funniest guy you ever played with was. Man, Dempy's up there. Dempy, Dempy did a lot of funny stuff. I had a lot of fun with the, a, a journeyman outfielder that people may or may not remember in Atlanta was Darren Bragg. Darren Bragg. Darren Bragg. We had some great, great times on the planes in Atlanta, going out to dinner. He was like this gun for hire fourth outfielder that we picked up in the late 90s early 2000s and man he he walked into that locker room and that was a pretty stuffy locker room at that time and he had like you know the tank top on with the gelled hair and the bats on his shoulder he was like i heard you needed some offense like he was just great <laughs> <laughs> that's good that's really good all right spin the wheel of moderately interesting things get you on your way Let's see here. Mini me. Oh, this is a good one. You spent plenty of time in hotel rooms over the years. What is your one go-to when you're starving or you're thirsty in the uh, little mini fridge or the, you know, the snacks that you, you're like, that thing's calling my name. Yeah. I'm a chocolate guy. So, yeah, I mean, if it's the M&Ms or the Snickers or the Reese's cups, whatever they got in their chocolate is getting destroyed. Yeah doesn't yeah. matter if it's 2 30 a.m in milwaukee you're crushing it I was never a big mini bar guy i had a lot of, a lot of teammates that went through the mini bar pretty heavy i was not one of them <laughs> i've had unknown teammates knock on my door at 2 30 and clean out my mini bar and then throw a hundred on my bed and leave everything in a pillowcase see you here you go d <laughs> Pretty good. Well, hopefully we will be raising a glass to you. Uh, where's the final being played? Miami. Come on. We need this. I know. I, I love the World Baseball Classic. I am a huge – I love watching the way other countries play the game. Yeah. I think it is so fun. It's so energetic. You know, we have to stay in, like, our own little box during the MLB season. I know that, fortunately, the box has gotten a little bigger, a little wider. Um. But, man, the energy that's going to happen over those three weeks is going to be awesome. Yeah, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. I love it. I'm excited for you, too, because I know how much this means to you and how much you're going to enjoy it and how much you're going to make it great for these guys who have billions of dollars collectively. But you're going to give them something that money can't buy. So I love that. And I uh, I really appreciate you you know, coming on, sharing some time with me, man. I miss, uh, I miss uh, seeing you. Rosie, I, I same here. You know how I feel about you. I text you the other night during the Super Bowl. I appreciate that. You do an amazing job, man. You're always on it. Always on it. I appreciate it. Uh, best to uh, Heidi and the kids. Mm-hmm. Enjoy that as well. And um, we will look forward to seeing you at the end of March, beginning of April on MLB Central for the 16 hours you're on every day. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> we'll fill it. 9 to 11 uh, this, this year. They did. 9 to 11. Oh, is that because Shahadi's getting too big time? She said, I can't do three hours. Yeah, I can't. I, you know, I don't ask questions. I can't figure it out. There's going to be some days they re-rack it. Some days they don't. I'll let them figure that out. Okay, good. Have fun with this experience, man. It was awesome catching up. Thank you. See you later, Chris. You got it. For our uh, special one-of-a-kind producer, Robbie Scirocco, that is Team USA manager Mark DeRosa. I'm Chris Rose. We'll see you next time on the Chris Rose Rotation, a production of John Boy Media.